Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, the podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Welcome back to Plain Spoken. I am Derek Fournier, your host, and I am back from Belgium. I want to thank my friends over in Belgium for hosting me. I was over there for three weeks. Originally, it was going to be one. And man, I got to tell you, every time I travel to Europe, I really have a great time, uh, especially in older cities uh, like uh, where I was in Antwerp. Uh, It was great to walk around and and see the way cities were built in the past. We don't have a lot of, uh, well, we have all the same history here. It's just not, not the same. Right, it's Native American history, which is fantastic in its own right. But I can't walk around Native American cities the way I can walk around in Belgium or in Hamburg or in Frankfurt or in Bomberg and and really kind of experience the city the way I did this this past few weeks with my new friends and colleagues um, over there in Belgium. But it was great to be back. It was great that they allowed me to shoot the uh, podcast from their office. I know I had some video issues, and I'm going to have video issues this week because I can't get the damn camera that I was using to work properly. So my podcast people, you're like, I don't give a crap. I'm listening to the audio. It doesn't matter to me. But for you video folks who are out there, apologies for the low fidelity of the video. Uh, This week is sort of a munge of topics. It's about how to build high performance culture. So I'm taking some buzzwords from previous uh, conversations and I'm jamming them together. And I'm doing this because I'm fortunate in that I've got a unique mix of coaching clients and corporate clients, and and I've been around for a long time, so I've seen a fair amount of stuff. And you've heard me sort of prattle on uh, almost too much, maybe, about culture and communication and some of these key buzzwords, but I don't know that I've cobbled them all together into one coherent piece. So on the blog this week, I kind of hinted that that's what this was going to be about. I'm going to try and pull together some common threads that I think lead to the establishment of a high performance culture. And I'm going to try and sort of compare and contrast in some ways, real time, things that I think are high performance or will render high performance from your teams versus what are sort of talking points. So I've got my slides up. And for you folks that are listening on the podcast, you can always come to the website at plainsight.net. That's plain, P-L-A-I-N hyphen site, S-I-G-H-T dot net. And you can click on the actual podcast link and you can see both the video in YouTube as well as your Spotify link. But today what we're talking about is is high performance. Now, high performance is about more than compensation and perks. And, you know, I made fun of LinkedIn for the, the tropes and the memes that exist about foosball and all that other garbage. So but really when I'm talking about perks here, I'm going to be talking about compensation because compensation is usually the first thing people think about when it comes to performance but it's rarely the most important thing. So we'll talk about that. And we're gonna talk specifically about aligning your team with your purpose. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career to to be a member of a number of teams that did this well, to work for leaders who established it well. And as I continue down this path, I am absolutely uh, astonished by how impactful it is to have a company that understands the criticality of aligning to purpose. So I will probably prattle on for quite some time about that. Part and parcel to creating high performance is understanding what empowerment means. And, you know, empowerment in and of itself is in fact crucial. Anytime you're trying to build a high performing team, you've got to get to the point where that team can scale both horizontally and vertically. And to do that, you have to be able to empower team members to go out there and do the things that you brought them in there to do or do the things that they have learned to do over time working with you. The underpinning of that empowerment is something you've heard me talk about ad nauseum, which is trust. And I wanna talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls you could face 
having empowerment discussions and deploying a, a model whereby empowerment is focused on and how you can avoid those things. It would be hard for me to talk about high performance if I didn't talk about recognition and growth and the acknowledgement thereof. I will uh, certainly recount my incredibly bad usage of this in the past um, with regards to recognition, thinking that recognition was only about the big things when the reality that I have learned, mm, my my observation, let's just let's not be so heavy handed as, as to say it's the reality because there could be many realities even outside of the Marvel Universe. But recognizing in general is critical, even things that we might perceive as small. People need to be seen. They need to be heard. There's something that is inherently um, human to that. And whether we couch it in the concepts of recognition or not, having a focus on that is something that will lead to the creation of high-performance teams. And you do that through clear communication and feedback. Now, this is something I don't mind that I talk about on almost every podcast because as I continue down the merry path of my life, I find that it doesn't matter whether you are five or 50, if you've got 20 years of experience or 20 minutes of experience, the reality is one of the huge differentiators between people who are successful and people who are unsuccessful in a business scope is communication, written and verbal. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have the largest lexicon. It doesn't mean you have to be the person who dominates every conversation. In fact, quite often, it's it's the inverse of that. But you have to be able to develop an authentic and clear method by which you communicate ideas, opinions, perspectives, uh, a way that you convey your lens to the world and to the people you work around in order to truly add value and to uh, to add to the high performance teams that you're trying to create. And last but not least is leading by example. Uh, and I am quite certain I will traipse into my common thoughts about that, but it, it bears repeating because I continue to see it everywhere I go. So perks over purpose or perks versus purpose. Perks, compensation, those pieces are almost always temporary. People will pursue compensation and these sorts of perks, but they will stay with the longer term pieces around purpose. Now, you've heard me talk about Simon Sinek, and I know I have a slide in here about that, whether it's your why or your who, you've got to find some common bonds that align your team efforts around common causes, meaningful purposes, something beyond the thing that you're doing, whether you're making parts for cars, creating software, providing consulting services, no matter what you do, you've got to have something that binds you together as a tribe or a group uh, that allows you to connect at a level that is beyond the thing that you do and is more the why you do it. And I don't mean to steal from uh, Mr. Sinek, but his point is incredibly critical. You've got to figure out what the thing is that allows you to establish rapid communication. Because if not, if you don't have that alignment around purpose, then every single thing you do will be taxed. Now, what do I mean? If you can't establish the why you do things, then you cannot possibly establish true transitive trust with your team members. And in an absence of trust, you cannot create an environment of good faith whereby we assume that each other are working towards better positive ends as a group. You may get it in pieces and parts, but it will never become the fabric of your operation. So as a leader, one of the things you have to do is communicate those core values uh, that really drive you. And I'm fortunate enough to be working with a company now that really focuses on it more than any company I've ever seen before. Uh, and, you know, it's I made a comment, I think actually today or yesterday, we were looking at a slide and the slide was one about values. And every company has these slides about values. It doesn't matter. It could be uh, Microsoft or Starbucks or the company down the street. We've all seen these slides a thousand times. The difference between good companies and great companies in this scope is great companies, it's not just a slide. It's, it's, it's a belief. It's an ethos. It actually informs every decision they make. But to crank that up to the next level, it has to be so completely obvious that all the members of the teams stop trying to create guide rails and guard posts and fences 
to make sure someone doesn't misunderstand them internally. Now, externally, you have to do this because externally, there is no establishment of trust. You strive for that. Your marketing team, your communications team, they all strive to create that. And when you do, you've really caught a tiger by the tail. But internally, you have a, a distinct advantage. Your, your team members, your teammates, the people you collaborate with the most closely, you can build true relationships, whether whether it's 10, 100, 1,000, or 10,000 people. You don't do it one to 10, thousand you do it one to one and then one to ten and you spread that out like a positive virus that there is trust here and this is why we do the things we do and this is how we make the decisions we make if you inform people that way then all of the things they do can be done under the auspices of good faith you can avoid hanlon's razor you can understand that if someone does something that pisses you off it was probably an accident there's no reason to jump off the deep end or fly off the handle or whatever uh you know phrase you want to use and rather just go talk to them and find out why there was a miscommunication. What was it that you didn't quite understand? So that purpose becomes the underpinning of all of these things. Now, that's not to say you don't need to compensate your people. Compensation needs to be market correct, but compensation is not just about dollars. It's about benefits. It's about culture. I, I've had multiple conversations with people over the last six to 10 weeks where the place that they are wasn't necessarily the place that offered them the most financial reward uh, or the, the next rung in the ladder for their career, but rather it was something else. It was something that made them feel at home. Now, this may sound Pollyanna, and there are certainly going to be times in your life where the job that you are looking for is not the job that has that sort of deep, resounding connection. Uh, Professor Galloway, who I like a great deal, Prof Scott G or whatever, Prof G, you know, go find someplace, go work, whether it's, you know, PwC or one of these giant firms, you can go and you can make money, you can get skills. And those are all true things. And certainly you can go to work every day and build those skill sets on the hope that in the future you can do the thing that matters. I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think that you can always be looking for the thing that matters. And if you don't find it, you can try and create it wherever you happen to be. Because if you embody it, then it will spread to the people that are closest to you wherever you are. And obviously I'm in a good mood because uh, I don't normally talk that much about one thing, but let's move on to empowerment and accountability. And this is important because I put both of these together. Autonomy is critical. The ability to delegate and to scale comes with the ability to empower. It will in fact encourage creativity and innovation. It will build trust. It will build confidence, but it only does it when it's complete. And what do I mean by complete? What I mean is if you trust someone in a group or department, a team, whatever it happens to be, to go do a thing, they have to accept the accountability to do the thing for every decision they make along the path to do those things and to realize that very rarely will the thing, air quotes, I'm making air bunnies for our podcast listeners, very rarely will that thing be such a small and discrete thing that it's not comprised of other pieces that may require different levels of involvement from people. People being involved does not destroy empowerment. It does not completely destroy autonomy. Now, that's coming from someone with what is called an autonomy trigger. The way I typically articulate it is if you ask me to do something, great. Now, stay the hell out of my way. Newsflash, I'm wrong. <laughs> it should be follow up and I'll give you the status. Help me create a communication model that allows us to keep each other informed of progress and to ask for help when needed that is conducive and constructive. That will drive results. It'll drive high performance. So the combination of empowerment with accountability is really what will lead to achieving goals and to lead to higher performance. One of the risks with empowerment is, and I've used this phrase uh, quite a bit in my career, is that it's a, it's a dual tool, and, and I say that it can be used as a sword and a shield. And this becomes very, very concerning at times, uh, and I've seen it for 30 years now. Sometimes people use empowerment like a sword, meaning they swing it around to keep you out of things, and this can create silos. That's not good. Empowerment should be a force for growth. They can also use it as a shield. To, to deflect blame, right? I can't do it because I'm not empowered, right? We've got to figure out ways to empower our teammates, our team members, our colleagues uh, in, in that air of good faith that I led in with 
that it is truly empowering. And the way you do that is to partner empowerment with accountability. Accountability is not a dirty word. I, If I were religious, I would pray that people would realize that accountability is just the cross check. I can't say, hey, would you let my dog, I'm empowering you to let my dog out. And then not hold you accountable if my dog uses the bathroom in the house. Now, accountability doesn't mean I'm going to come beat you with a two by four. It just means I now know what went wrong. I can get more details. It could have been you got pulled aside. You couldn't be there, whatever. But we've got to make sure that it's a closed loop. It cannot be just an open-ended thing where you're now empowered. Go forth and do things. Well, what things? I don't know. Stuff. There has to be a connection to accountability. Now, after that gets done and things get accomplished, and along the way, to be honest, it doesn't have to be major milestones. We have got to create a spirit of recognition and growth. Now, the growth piece comes from allowing people to stretch, to do things maybe they're not quite ready for, uh, with coaching, with counsel, with guidance, with assistance, with mentorship. Those are all really, really powerful things. But meaningful recognition will absolutely drive performance more than uh, basic raises and compensation. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't reward people with compensation. You need to. You need to treat your your performers, your high performers, really, really well. It is, you know, my friend used to say she wishes she had been successful enough for her job title to be philanthropist because she would know then that she had truly arrived. Compensation was no longer a concern. No, many of us are not there. So, so compensation does matter. But what matters more is meaningful recognition of the work that we do, the the impact that we make, not just the end impact. And this is where I used to really screw this up. I used to think it had to be just big things. And I used to use the phrase, well, I expect to win, so I don't need to be told when I win. I, I get it. I was a hard driving uh, type A, whatever the hell you want to call it. And, and there are certainly benefits to that. But the cost to it is just absolutely toxic. I mean, if you see me on video, I'm only 26 and I look like this. Not really 26, but the, the stress is very real. So a phrase that I used to use, and I may have mentioned this in the in the podcast before, was I don't thank the light for turning on when I flip a switch because I expect the light to turn on when I flip a switch. The problem with that incredibly stupid, short-sighted, narrow-minded interpretation of recognition is that sometimes you do need to thank the light because the light could be blown out. It could be indicative of some sort of a circuitry problem. When people do things, you may expect them to be successful, but maybe they don't. So many people that I encounter in work and so many times in my own life, you probably all have encountered this concept of imposter syndrome. We all get it from time to time. We Very few of us think we are just incredibly adept and capable of everything. We've met someone along the way, a parent, a family friend, a teacher, a colleague who had faith in us, who recognized things that we did or, or skills and talents that we had. And they encouraged us by recognizing those things. And then we were made, uh, uh, we were availed to growth opportunities. That combination of recognition and growth is one of the secret sauces for performance. Now, to do that, you kind of have to make sure that you align people's roles because their superpowers have to align. I think their working genius is one of the tools that I just recently was encountered. Um, if you can align them with the places where they have a superpower, it's fantastic. So you, you don't go and create a role for a person. You, you create roles that make sense, and then you find people who have traits that lend themselves to those roles, right? If, if those roles don't align, then you're, it's the typical square peg in a round hole problem. So you can have great team members who are in the wrong seats, Right, not to steal from Jim Collins and his seats on the bus concept. So get your people in the right seats and then make sure that the seats you have align with the broader business goals and the business needs. And this is super, super important. Um, it isn't sufficient to have things defined if you don't define them in the scope of your business. Right, You can define them uh, you know, almost uh, in a sterile sense or an academic sense. But just because it's the definition that you get from the internet or from ChatGPT or from Copilot doesn't mean it's the definition that makes sense for you. Now, I'm not arguing 
for alternative facts here. You guys know that's not a thing to me. What I am arguing is right tool for the right job, right description for the right job, right level for the right job. And sometimes it's where we are in our development curve. So you've got to work on that alignment in order to get things humming the way they need to. Now, this is uh, the time where the communication babbling goes on. But I, I have to tell you that the, the further along I go and with every client I work with, um, and this is probably more pervasive in my coaching clients because I get more in-depth quicker with individuals than you can with a, a larger team, even really strong communicators need to make sure that they're cross-checking their communication style and they understand the importance of clear, open, and honest communication. We should, this is one of those things that we should work on every day. We should ask for feedback on every day because the concept of explicit communication, and no, I don't mean profanity, which sometimes I drop on this podcast, but clear and articulate communication that is cross-checked, meaning when you, when you provide feedback to someone, confirming that they understood it. I, I wrote a blog a thousand years ago about uh, communication being a send and a receive, and quite often... I think we get more enamored with our send and don't care as much about the receive. Now, it's one problem to not care about the receive. It's another problem to not even check that there was a receipt. So when I talk about clear communication and I'll talk about feedback loops here, that other side, that act, that acknowledgement that I heard the words you said, I understand why you said them. I have synthesized them through my lens or my filter, since I'm using auditory here, filter probably makes more sense. And here's how I have received it. Yes, it takes a little bit of time, but I promise you, if you build those kinds of mechanisms, you will create clarity, you will promote growth, you will speed things up. And by using that sort of feedback, you can absolutely drive growth more rapidly. It will help your teams. Your teams will communicate more clearly. They will be more empowered to provide constructive feedback and you will make fewer mistakes because you will not have a situation where you are in a state of confusion. And you've heard me talk about confusion before. This is where our expectations do not meet re our reality. We fall into confusion and then we, we start thinking things like, well, someone's bad, stupid, or lazy. Not because we're lazy or that we're stupid or that we're bad. It's just as human animals, that's one of the things that we do. So if you can really integrate that concept of clear communication and full feedback loops into everything that you do, that will spread to your smaller teams and your smaller teams will spread across your organization and it will start to permeate everything you do. And I think sometimes we limit this to easy communication. Make no mistake. This is almost more critical. Well, almost. It is, in fact, more critical the more critical the communication is. That's a, a truism. It's just harder. Um, I'm not a Stoic by nature, and I'm not an expert on Stoicism. I, I'm fortunate to know people who are philosophers, and they certainly know more about Stoicism than I. Uh, but rarely is it the thing that is the problem. It's our reaction to the thing. And that is so true when it comes to communication that it's almost physically painful to reflect on. That conversation that you're avoiding is not getting better with age. You've heard me say the phrase, my friend Tom uh, Lamonti has said for years, bad news is better than stale bad news. And I try to live it as a maxim. I have screwed it up. And every time I screw it up, it's more painful because I know better. When I didn't know better, it was easy. Like, that's just ignorance. Ignorance is, is fine. Uh, once you're made aware of it, you can go get educated, and then you aren't ignorant anymore. But once you are no longer ignorant, it's almost a more egregious mistake. And it happens. We're human. But that communication loop, that explicit level of communication, that feedback loop as part of your communication, even though it seems incredibly over done at times. I assure you is not. And once you start to build rapport, uh, cadence, uh, clarity with individuals, you can turn that dial back, but start way too far on the other side to make sure that the assumptions you're making are correct. 
Because once you've done that, then your velocity will increase. And I promise you, it's going to be a tortoise and hare thing. It's going to feel like you're going really slow at the beginning. And then it's going to be actually more than tortoise and hare. As the tortoise, you're going to become the hare. And it's going to really propel you forward. Uh, I believe the last piece in here is to lead by example. And, and I always end up talking about this concept. But high performance is contagious when it's modeled from the top. Now, that doesn't mean hours. It doesn't mean uh, loud. It doesn't mean dominating conversations. What it means is whoever you are in an organization, whether you know it or not, you're leading someone. And I think sometimes we get really mired in the concept of organizational charts and hierarchies and who's on top and who's on bottom. And don't you dare make jokes about that because that's inappropriate. And this is a business podcast. But what is more critical is that we all collaborate. We all work together. And your behaviors are what are followed, not just your words. In fact, oftentimes, not even your words if your actions are not in lockstep with the words, right? So whether it's about work-life balance, which is the one I usually bang my chest on here because I do a crap job of it, or if it's the way you communicate or it's follow-up or it's how we speak to customers or, or, or whatever the topic is, your words are the beginning, your actions are the follow-through. And leading by example is critical. And when you don't, you set things back dramatically. So whether, whether the behaviors you're modeling are good or bad, they're going to be absorbed because they're also going to be contagious. What you, what you say and do as a leader, no matter what your scope, whether you're a leader of a small team or whether you're only a leader by proxy. And when I say only, I don't mean it as a diminishing uh, term there. What I mean is some people think, well, I'm an individual contributor. I don't lead anyone. You do. You're probably a subject matter expert in something. And so every time you engage on that subject, you're leading people intellectually. You're leading them uh, contextually. So every one of your actions leads at some level or another. So you've got to be mindful and be uh, be aware that you're modeling behaviors. So in conclusion, there are a couple of key areas here, five that I think lead to high performance teams. Uh, I am in an incredibly good mood uh, after travel, which I haven't done in a while. And, uh, you know, recently engaging with a new client who is just an incredible model in some ways. And, you know, every team's got things we can improve on. But, man, to find a company that is as engaged in the humanity of what we do for work is absolutely exciting. And so if my tone and tenor has been more upbeat than normal, that may well be what it's from. But, but I'm going to review purpose. You've got to align with a clear purpose. And it, it can be aspirational. It shouldn't be boil the ocean aspirational. It should be something that's achievable. It should be clear. It should be consistent. Uh, you, you do need to empower your team members, but you can't empower them in the absence of accountability. And accountability has got to not be a damn dirty word in any organization you're in or with yourself. You've got to make sure you partner empowerment with accountability. Recognition and acknowledgement of growth. Whether they're little or big, that size is relative. You've got to make sure you're doing it. The little things matter. A million little things pile in quickly. And that humanity that is evoked by taking the time to recognize people's efforts, uh, people's challenges, people's results, people's progress, uh, becomes one of the things that separates good relationships from great relationships and great relationships from incredible leaders. So make sure that we're you're spending enough time there. I, I know that I if I could change something, that's one of the ones I'd go back and do differently throughout my career is I would recognize people more. Um, that's That's certainly one of the faults that I am keenly aware of. Communication. Uh, if you have not established the trust level necessary to communicate openly, you need to work on that first. If you cannot establish the trust to communicate openly with your team members, you probably shouldn't be team members. And that's a topic for another day. But make no mistake, not every group of people is meant to collaborate. It's just not the way it works. Sometimes it's better that people don't collaborate. 
Uh, and that's not bad. That doesn't mean you think someone's a bad person. You want them ill. You wish them ill. It just means it doesn't work here. So make sure that you understand that underneath any communication is trust. And you've got to build that up throughout every interaction you have. And last, for our leaders out there, lead by example and realize that everything you do will be modeled and followed to a certain degree. So uh, that's about high performance. Now, that sounds like a lot of what I call basic blocking and tackling because it is. So you guys have heard me talk about sports before. I often use the analogy my dad used, uh, which is, you know, if I get three and a half yards every down in American football for my international listeners, you need 10 yards for a first down. You get four downs. That would work. Um, it's not fun and exciting sometimes, but it works. And you know what? It's reliable. So the basic blocking and tackling is one of the things that I always focus on. You start with the basics. When we coach offensive line, we started with stance and starts. It doesn't matter what you do 10 steps down the road if you start from the wrong stance. Let's get that going. These pieces, these five building blocks of high performance are your stance and starts for building a high performance organization. Um, what methods have you used? How do you encounter in your organization? What organizations have you been in that you consider high performance? Do you think I'm full of crap with some of these things? Uh, I, I certainly don't think that they are easy, but I do think they are simple, and that's different. None of these require secondary degrees. None of these require a Duke MBA. None of these require thousands of hours of grinding into things. They require sincerity. They require effort. They require focus. They require discipline. But it takes more discipline to get out and walk every morning than it does to do this. So I would encourage you to look through that list. Tell me if you think I've left things off. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying the podcast. I appreciate all of you who are listening or watching. Uh, we'll continue to stay on this two-week cadence. I don't know what the topic will be next week. I've gotten some email from folks that I'm going to go through and see if there's some topics that might be a little bit more far afield. We might even do some technical topics. Who knows? But uh, as always, you can find us on plainsight.net. That's P-L-A-I-N hyphen sight, S-I-G-H-T dot net. But thanks for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show, found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the,